We're going to be from the book of Romans today. And uh, just bear with me. Uh, we're going to be talking about the ministry of reconciliation. Ministry of reconciliation. And there's a passage that I did not uh, submit to Cliff. This is not his fault. Uh, so I want to read a portion first. You're going to see Romans up there. That's coming later. But I want to read from uh, 2 Corinthians 5. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this tax, task of reconciling people to him. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 18. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sins so that we could be made right with God through Christ. So that's a very good passage talking about reconciling people to God. And then our text this morning is from Romans chapter 10. That last passage was also by Apostle Paul, and now he's speaking in Romans 10, again with the idea of reconciling people to God. And it says in verses 13 to 15, he says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. So you'll be maybe seated this morning. We're talking about the ministry of reconciliation. You know, I looked at the definition of reconciliation it said to become friendly again or to bring back to acceptance restoring a broken relationship and just very briefly we all know the story in the book of Genesis when God created man there was thing was perfect sin entered the earth the game plan changed men were estranged from God and then we were born lost people and so we're in the business. God's plan of recovery is that the world might be saved through people like you and I. And that's what Paul was saying. God reconciled us to him through Christ. And then we have this message, our witness, our testimony, to tell others about Christ, to bring them back to right relationship with the Lord. And so right off in Romans uh, chapter 10 Verse 1 to 4, you can hear the heart of Apostle Paul. He's just desperate for his people, the Jewish people, to be saved. And so we're going to understand their problem, their dilemma. And listen to Paul, how he speaks. Dear brothers and sisters, the longing of my heart and my prayer to God is for the people of Israel to be saved I know what enthusiasm they have for God, but it is misdirected zeal. For they don't understand God's way of making people right with himself. Refusing to accept God's ways, they cling to their own way of getting right with God by trying to keep the law. For Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given. As a result, who, all who believe in him are right with God. So we understand when we talk about the law, that was what the Lord gave the people of Israel for that season of time. It is the law of God, and it's to be kept today, by the way. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when we talk about the law and the Jews were under the law, we almost sound like it's a negative thing. We have to remember the law is for, for all time. It's for us today to be obeyed today. Yeah. But the problem here was they would not receive the coming of Christ as the Messiah. That was the Jewish problem. And so he says they have misdirected zeal. They're still trying to worship God through the law. Again, there's nothing with the law, but man couldn't keep it. That's why 
Paul, if you read Romans 7, he talks about his struggle because of the law. There's nothing with the law, it's good. What's wrong is with us, the people. Right. We couldn't fulfill it. It, it is, was and is God's standard today. And so the Lord God sent Jesus to die, who fulfilled the law as a perfect man in our behalfs. So we understand it. So what Paul is saying here, we're supposed to make every attempt now ourselves to reconcile, to bring people to Christ, to restore the relationship that was broken. And so we always quote the scripture quite often, Cliff and myself, that Jesus Christ is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. There's one way to God, it's through Jesus Christ. Salvation in no other name. Early church, if you might want to know, they were known as the people on the way. Mm -hmm. The people on the way, on the way to heaven, and we are also the people on the way. And so, we're going to be talking about today about reconciliation, bringing people back that we witness to in right relationship with God as their Savior. And so the first thought I'm going to leave with you is very basic today. We need to know that we have been saved to help save others and point them to Christ. Matthew 28, 16, 20, the Great Commission. Then the 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and in earth. Therefore, go. There's a mandate. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands. That's the discipling process. I have given you, and be sure of this, I will be with you to the end of the age. So in that great commission, we have been given the mandate from Christ himself to go to our worlds mm -hmm. and preach and share the gospel with people. Amen. We were saved to serve people in different ways. We serve him through worship ministry, we serve him in preaching, teaching, and caring, and all the beautiful stuff we do. But our primary assignment really as the people of God is to share Christ with people that we know that need to know the Lord. Amen. It's wonderful. You know, I've got a couple of my Wednesday night ladies here, and uh, they're sitting there in the back, so happy to see them. Uh, every Wednesday night, we, Susan and I share Christ with them. In fact, we share Christ with one another. And that's what God has called us to do. But I want to tell you today, a lot of people, Christians too, I think, we forget about the Great Commission. We forget that we are supposed to reconcile people to God, to witness to people. And so we think church is just beautiful what we do come to church worship pray give teach that's the discipleship process and that's how we grow and mature that's necessary that's what we have to do to be strong christians that's why you're here today that's why we have the wednesday night bible studies and the thursday night bible studies and the lmc things all these beautiful things are to disciple christians to equip them to do the work but the secondary thing is you have to realize that it's not just about us to sit in church. We have a call of God to share the gospel with other people. God works through people. So that's our task. That's, so you know what? I want to key on the congregation today. And I'm not picking on you and I'm not judging you or nothing. But I want to maybe make you think a little bit about how you that are sitting in the seats, Cliff and I included, but primarily, you that are sitting in the seats are a key part of reaching our worlds. I think you'll connect real quick. We know Christ as our great shepherd. Psalms. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We know God as our good shepherd who protects his sheep, his flock, right? And then when you see pastors like Cliff and I, we are also called shepherds, yeah. to shepherd the flock of God. Right. 
And our primary purpose is to teach, lead, feed, and correct. That's right. Ministering to you. Teach, lead, feed, and correct. So a lot of times in churches, we understand the Lord is the shepherd, my pastor is the shepherd, but I would like to say today, what about the flock? Yeah. What about the sheep? Yeah. What about the congregation? Yeah. Yeah. Jay Adams wrote a book years ago, and he said, it is the sheep that beget sheep. That's right. Now, doesn't that make sense? Mm -hmm. The shepherd doesn't produce sheep. It's the flock. Yeah. 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 In the natural, that's true. But even in the spiritual sense, mm -hmm. Cliff and I reach people for God too. We witness. But what I'm saying, I'm thinking about the sheep today, the members of our church or any church today. Yes. You are the ones that will reproduce yes. through your witness. I would venture to say our membership here meets more unsaved people than Cliff and I do during the week. We're in the studying the Bible, preparing services. That's our job, to give ourselves to prayer and the Word, according to the book of Acts, correct? Yes. But see, it is the congregation, and I want to excite you today. You're like the sales force yes. that moves out after we equip you and teach you yes. and nurture you and if the flock, I'll say this too, Pastor, if the flock is healthy, it will reproduce. And that's why we're trying to produce healthy Christians, because healthy Christians will be strong in faith, strong in prayer, strong in the world, and strong in their witness. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Statistically speaking, I've said it before. They have found, now when I talk about growing the church, we're talking about filling with people that love the Lord, not just putting bodies in the seats. That's not it. We're not just trying to get numbers here. But on the other hand, those are people that need to be one to Christ that we can invite yeah. to church yeah. and touch them for the Lord. And that's where the membership can come in so much. They found out in statistics that and I've looked at it all the years we did ministry here. We've had outreaches. We've had movies. We've had a lot of events, even my big band on Monday night. But the greatest tool of reaching people has still been the church members in Friday, friends and family. Yes, that's right. Susan was in advertising years ago. She was trying to contact a church in Wilmington. And they said, we don't advertise. Our best advertisement is people tell other people about the Lord here. That's right. And their church is packed with people. The word of mouth. Christian saying, taste and see. Come to church. Join me at, at the house. Come to the ladies' thing. Come to the men's thing. Come to the movies. Come to all the beautiful stuff that we do. It is really the membership, the sheep of the congregation. When we're talking about reconciled and reaching people, you have the numbers. And I just thought to myself, we always thought about what would bring revival to the world? Wouldn't it be if all the members of every church all over the world were touching people for Christ and sharing their faith? There would be explosive growth. And so I'm not condemning you. I've never invited anybody today or make you feel bad. But I just want to challenge you a little bit to think. I have a responsibility not only to be a healthy disciple Christian, but I have a task given by the Lord. I'm supposed to go into my world and share the gospel with people that I know. So Cliff and I and our teachers and Robin are doing the equipment. Hopefully the sheep, you that are out there, will reach out to your friends. Now I'm gonna say something. When we're talking about evangelism, my father was the greatest evangelist I ever knew personally. And I'll tell you why. He didn't bring tons of people to church. He brought some. But I'll tell you this about my dad. Every person that he met, if time permitted, would not get away unless he shared the gospel. Nobody. I watched him as a son. People would come to the doors. If the Jehovah Witness would come in, says, oh, come in the side. We'll have a little Bible study. They say, now you just kneel down and pray. Then they start running. <laughs> Nobody crossed, crossed my father's path when I watched that didn't receive the gospel. 
I'll give you a story. We were doing some work years ago in somebody's house, and uh, I was helping my father, and a painter came out. He was in his 30s. And he thought we were a couple of sinners, you know, my dad and myself. We just, you know, we were just there working. So he opens up with the most crude words that you can imagine, just guttural talk, stuff you see written on the bathrooms of the schools, okay? Do they still do that? And I was humiliated because I was a teenage boy and I knew all this trash. And here's my dad, a pastor. I said, oh my God. We got finished with the work we were doing. I went back to the car. He wasn't coming to the car. And I waited and waited. And would you believe this? I walked to that person's backyard. He had that foul mouth painter kneeling down, right. asking the Lord to forgive him of his sins. I was amazed by that, the boldness of that man. Now, that's very intimidating. I cannot do like my father did. I fall short there. I have different ways of doing it. But I'm going to show you a little bit later in the sermon how you can be just and effective in a different way. I just gave you that story because that was my dad, but we can't all be like him. Later in the sermon, I'll show you how you can do it in a natural way and bless people too. But the thing we want to get in our hearts this morning, first of all, is we need to know that we were saved to reach lost people for Jesus, for the Lord. It's not just be being fattened in the local church and eating and being blessed and all that. We need to share the gospel with our friends. Right. And so we establish that. The next thing, we want to look at the urgency, the method, and the scope of our call. So we'll call it our evangelism action plan. There could be others, but this is just what I'm using today. From Luke 14, 16 to 23, there's a story about a certain man who gave a great supper. Then he said to him, a certain man gave a great supper and invited many and sent his servant at the supper time to say to those who were invited, come for all things are ready. But they with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excuse. People will have their excuses. Another said, I bought five yokes of oxen, and I'm going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Still another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, being very angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets, and the lanes of the city and bring here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded. There's still room. There's still room. Then the master said to her servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. So when we look at that story in the Bible, we can just imagine the master could represent the Lord who has this great banquet. We're being fed from the bread of life. All the beautiful things we get fed as Christians, how to live, how to act, how to be delivered, all these things. And so the Lord wants people to come to him. So he sent his servants, which is you and I. We are the ones that have been sent by the servant, by the Lord, to go out and compel people to come. Amen. And he says, bring him in so that my house will yes. be filled. You know, we've got a great supper here. We've got a lot of room. There's a lot of extras. I'm seeing these seats here today. A lot of leftovers on Sunday when Cliff preaches. We could, someone else could share that stuff. Those beautiful words of life. But that is the urgency of the Lord for us to represent Christ, to tell others about Jesus, go out to the highways and hedges and compel them to come. The lame, the blind, the halt. Highways, hedges. The people that are busy in life, like I that bought the oxen, the other one that married a wife, the busy people, all these people, our world before us, 
God has placed us here in our own way to reach them and to compel them to come and discover the beauty of being a Christian. Yeah. That's the heart of God. And that was the heart of Paul. When you remember the scriptures that read, it was his heart's desire. He longed that his people Israel would be saved. Yes. It hurt Paul that they were not saved. And he said in another passage of scripture that he would give up his salvation if it would cause his people to come to the Lord. Wow. Yeah. I'm going to bring up my father again, the evangelist. This just popped up. He went to the Philippines many, many years ago. He was already sick with heart trouble. Our family did not want him to go. We were at the airport. He had some high blood pressure problems. My mother certainly was worried. We were concerned as kids. But he said, you know, family, I must go. And he said, if I have to kneel down before my family and beg them to accept the Lord Jesus Christ, I will do it. He went to the Philippine Islands, and I hear tell that's exactly what happened. He compelled, he begged his people to accept Jesus Christ as Savior. About 17, 18 were saved, baptized. Some of our families and the members now are ministering, even in the Middle East, pastors. We supported a church there for several years in that barrio of Sinai, Ilocosor. He came back, and within a year after he came back, he passed away from a major heart attack. As his son, I was a little mad. I said, you know, Dad, you went over there, we told you, it was so hot, the food was so difficult, he was sick. But I really believe my father really gave his life for his family, because he was that desperate that desperate that he would, he loved us too. Believe me, he loved us so you could believe. But he felt that call in his heart, that passion in his heart, that thing that we used to call a burden yeah. in the early Pentecostal church. Yeah. Something that burns on you and says, I've got to get these people saved. That's the communicating the message with urgency. And that will only happen when you have a passion or a burden for the lost. To see people as lost headed for hell without a savior. And if you look at them that way, that will motivate you to share that witness with the people you know. But that was my father's story. I really believe he gave the last ounce of his life to save his family. 15, 16, like I said, were saved and in ministry because he was willing to go and lay down his life for them. He had that urgency. You know why the Lord is that way? He wants everyone to be saved. The Bible says that Christ is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. We have people out there that think, you know, Christians are crazy, they're mean, they, they, we want to judge everybody, we want to condemn everybody, and, and Jesus just can't wait to send people to hell. That's not true. He is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. In Ezekiel 33, 11, it says, this is what he says, this is what he said to Israel, say to them as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? Right. That was directed to Israel, but that's how the heart of God is toward lost people. Why should you die? Why should you choose the way of death? Come to the way of life. Amen. The devil comes to kill, to rob, and to destroy. I have come that you might have life and have life in abundance. That's the heart of God. He is for life. And that's why we witness to people. Amen. Because we can see that if they're lost and in sin, they're destroying their health, they're destroying their life, they're destroying their families. Why die? Come to the fountain of life, Jesus Christ. Yes. He is not happy. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. I don't care how vile they've been against the Lord. God takes no pleasure in their death. He wants them to be saved because he created 
them. Remember the unsaved people are our brothers and sisters, at least by virtue of the creation. They were also created by God with the possibility to be saved, but they missed the mark. And that's where we come in and try to best to restore them so that they may have life, a blessed life and not death. No pleasure in the death of the wicked. But the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn from your evil ways. And that's the question of the Lord. He said it to Israel. He says it to any sinner today. Why do you choose death? Why? I offer you life. And that is done by Christians sharing their faith with people. We've got some of you here, I've noticed, that have invited friends to church, and they're starting to come. That's a beautiful thing. It, it, it's the good news. Yeah. Let's move on. We have looked at the necessity to know. We've looked at the urgency, method, and scope of our call now. A term I've been using lately, tell and show others, tell and show others your God story. There are only two types of people who are interested in God. Those who are and those who are not yet. (laughs) There's a lot of people that are saying no today that are going to say yes later. (laughs) I tell you the story of the musician friend I knew. Used to be a Jehovah Witness. He had three good Christian friends. Because I asked him, I said, Bob, how did you come to know the Lord? It's awful tough to win a Jehovah Witness. He said, I had three friends that loved me and stayed with me and witnessed to me for 15 years. And it was their love for me. He said, I have had every opposition to every scripture they had. We used to practice that all the time in the kingdom hall. I had it all made out. But it was their love for me, even when I rejected them, that broke me and won me to Christ. How will they know that we are believers? By our love. Those who are interested and those who are not yet. So this is where we get in the problems. When we invite people and they refuse our invitation. I was talking to one of the ladies at our church. I won't name her. She's sitting back there today. She was saying that she, and she tries. Well, we all say the same thing. I try to invite people, but I just can't make them. Well, I've done the same thing. I've done the same thing. I witnessed to my band members, gave them tracks and all that stuff. The last time I did it, about a year ago, longer, uh, I said, if you ever, if we're in COVID. If you have any problems, I have spiritual matters, come and talk to me. I'm, I know I'm a fellow musician, but you, know, you can come to me. I'm willing. Only one person responded, but he rejected But he says, you know what, Sam? I'm not ready for what you're talking about, but can I still be your friend? And I said, of course. That's how you deal with those people. Even when they say no, it's cool, it's all right, you're always my friend. Eventually that man's gonna think about it more, but the seed was planted. You know, don't let the refusal, the no's come. How many of you here have been in sales? Of any sales, yeah, okay. They used to say, when I used to think about that, and maybe the number's wrong, that it would take about 10 plus calls to get one yes. That's a lot of rejection. Judy used to be in sales, I know that. Claire. 10 sales, 10 calls to get one. Carl, our eagle, was saying in our Bible study about three months ago that a person that has been led to Christ has been witnessed to by at least six other people before he said uncle to the Lord gave in and accepted Jesus. Six people did. So that is the key here. You don't have to get a yes, New Hope members. All you have to do is share the gospel. The Bible calls it sowing the seed. So if you don't close the deal, don't worry about it. All you're asked to do is to tell them about the Lord and try to lead them, but they don't go for it. That's all right. You have done your part. You are a witness for Christ. You know, I thought about it in our own family. 
in our family, on both sides of the family, my dad being a pastor and all that stuff and our relatives, a lot of our relatives we witnessed two years ago about the Lord and some of them responded. A lot of them didn't. But I looked throughout the years and throughout the decades, a lot of the people that said no 20 or 30 years ago, remember I'm 83, I find out they've been end up ministers. Right. Work ministering in the gospel. The seed was planted decades earlier, and they're now in ministry. The seed that was planted in Sinai, Ilocosor, the Philippines, mm -hmm. now people are in ministry in Dubai and in, in the Middle East from our family that it caught on later. What did the Apostle Paul say? that he planted, for Corinthians 3, 6, I planted the seeds in your hearts. Apollos, the great speaker, who needed the Holy Spirit, by the way, watered it. God gave the increase. So I want to take the pressure off the sales force here to New Hope, you soul winners that I'm preparing here today. Don't worry about closing the sale. All you have to do is tell them about the Lord. That's all God requires. And let the Holy Spirit in time convict them or send someone else to reinforce what you said. And when they're harvested in, you will be part of the process because you had at least the boldness to share the truth with your friends. Amen. So I know how you feel. We've got some relatives still that I've talked about the Lord. They haven't come around. And I could really be bummed too. I said, you know, after all I told you, and then, well, God's good and you still say no. All God calls me and Susan to do is to sow the seed. Right. And I believe in time, some of those people are going to come to know the Lord. Brother Robert here sitting down, a plumber led him to the Lord from Wilmington uh, Har Harbor Christian Center. Right. Anthony Munoz, those guys. I imagine Robert might have been a bad hombre at one time. I'm not sure. <laughs> it probably was 30 people that witnessed to him before he, he broke down. <laughs> I still remember his story. They were saying, are you ready yet? Are you ready yet? Are you? He's told us the story. He says, yes, I'm ready. He finally gave in to the Lord. That's his personal story. But he saved rock solid today because some people prayed for him and shared the gospel with him. And he probably said some no's for a while, but he finally said yes to the Lord because people took the time to just share their faith. I want to encourage you today when you walk out of this place to be excited about sharing your faith. Don't worry about having to make them kneel down and, and doing all this stuff. I told you too, the method that you use, just tell them what the Lord has done for you. I believe in passing tracks, I've done that. I've done street evangelism too. But you know, I think the best way, they used to call it friendship evangelism. If you get a chance to talk with something and it, the uh, matter of faith comes up, just tell them what the Lord has done for you. This is what the Lord has done. He's blessed me. He's healed me. He's provided for me, my family. He's protected us. And I repeat what Cliff said, and I think I've done this a couple of times already. And then the good thing is, now what do you need in your life? It's a good way to segue from that, what he's done for me, what he can do for you. And just ask them a question. Just talk with them. See, so those are some of the ways we can witness not only by our word. Now, I told you my dad could do it verbally with boldness, but none of us all of us that. But we can witness by our conduct and by our lives, which is the biggest and the greatest right. witness, how we live. Living a godly life, if you've never opened your mouth once, but if you've been living a godly life on your workplace, in your neighborhood, in your home, you have been a witness. People are noticing. You know, they talk about leaders, what leaders are. Leaders just simply means influence. You're either influencing somebody for the good or for the bad every day, just the way you walk, the way you talk, the way you conduct yourself, the way you deal with people. People will notice. And some of them are going to wonder when all hell's going on in your family and somebody is sick and things are going wrong, and they're going to wonder why you don't lose it. You'll be able to tell them, is because I've got God in my life. People will notice. You know, they will notice. Tell them your story, how God has blessed you. Do you even know 
with all the grumpy people. I live on Western Avenue, and it's like a racetrack right now. You notice how people are speeding today? Yeah. Not stopping at the stop signs? I'm scared. And everybody looks so angry out there. Even look at those people on the news that are on the wrong side of the fence. They all look like they're mad or something. <laughs> Nobody looks happy. Nobody looks happy. But when they can see you going to the store with a smile on your face, how are you doing today? And you go to the bank and you see the lady's name tag there and you say, how are you doing, Lorraine, Betty, Joan? You know, mentioning somebody's name makes them feel so good. Those little tips are the things that people will notice. Just being a nice, courteous person in this world today is impactful, I'm telling you. So it's not that hard. The way you live, the way you conduct yourself, sharing your faith, telling them your story, you can do it. Yes. And a lot of you have been doing it already, and you probably thought, man, I never witnessed, I never had it on a track. Don't you know you've really been doing it? You are. Yeah. The Bible says you're the gospel. It's written in your hearts, not on stone, but on flesh. And so what will happen is people will notice. All of my neighbors that know me, they know I'm a Christian. First of all, they see me walking out with a Bible every Sunday morning. Suit, I'm the only one who wears the suit in the whole neighborhood. <laughs> and then we've shared our faith with people. Uh, it's beautiful. We had a neighbor. He moved away, Larry Sheets. He was my neighbor, and he was having another Bible study with, I think it was kind of a cult next door. I never bothered him. But when they stopped that, it wasn't him, it was his brother who was hosting it. I met him in the yard one day. I said, you know what? We have a Bible study next door on a Wednesday night. We share some food. I do a little Bible study and we pray. You're invited. And I says, I want you to know, if you don't like it, you don't come back, you won't hurt my feelings. But just come and check it out. Yeah. That man came and he never missed a Wednesday until he moved to out there in Palm Desert somewhere. Just by saying, come on over, share some food with us. Fellowship with us. That's all it is. I didn't have to wrestle them, get them a heavy luck and quote 29 scriptures. He saw the gospel in our witness to him in a loving, kind way. And I got, I'm glad because my Wednesday night ladies are here, some of them, they love coming there. Right, girls? You better say yes. Yeah. <laughs> they love it there. They won't miss for love or money. And so we can witness to Christ by our lives. Years ago, as I get ready to close today, there was a book that was entitled, maybe 30 years ago, Contagious Christianity. Think about that. We've got COVID that's contagious, you know? Sin seems to be contagious. Christianity should be contagious, it should be catchy. People should see something that they catch from us, the gospel. Yes. It should be contagious. You know, the Bible says that we are, not, we are salt and light. We're light in all the darkness. But I think about the salt. The salt flavors life. When everybody's grumpy, oh, this is rotten. Oh, we're good. God is good. Salt flavors life. Salt also preserves life. And salt causes a thirst. Do we make people thirsty? They may not say it. They may never even tell you. But if you've been living the life, there will be something about you. And I'm not bragging. I'm not saying it's me either. I hope that is. That people will see that attracts them to, what, to you and what you have. And what does Peter say in 1 Peter 3.15? But sanctify the Lord in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is within you with meekness and fear. That's the NKGV. I like the NLT, the last two words. That is within you with gentleness and respect. That's a huge key right there. I've seen some evangelists that are ramming down people's throats, scream. We were at the Rose Bowl with Susan 
years ago and there was some street evangelists and they were saying, all you sinners out there, you're going to hell. And man, I said, they're glad they're not getting attacked. They won't go to, they won't go to the inner city and talk like that. I know that they were, were decent people around, kind people. That's not the way to do it. Right. With gentleness yes. and respect. That's right. Don't just turn on them just because they say, well, I'm a Jehovah Witness. So just listen to them and reason with them for a while. Talk with them for a while. Gently share the gospel. Let's stand to our words today, to our feet, after hearing this word. Reconciliation. Aren't you glad you were reconciled to the Lord? You were saved once we were lost, and now you have God in your life. And now we have this beautiful opportunity to reconcile people to Christ. And I like to challenge our church especially. We've got a nice, beautiful little chapel here. And it wouldn't be nice if it was filled with people. But it's only going to happen when our memberships, including Pastor Cliff and I, do our best to invite people to church. Invite people to church. Look at this congregation. We're multi-ethnic. That's what the church, the world is trying to force on everybody. We're doing it right here. Not every church is like this. Church, hear me well. We've got the beautiful blend here where we can invite people. Beautiful services, sound biblical teaching and prayer and ministries. I challenge you, think about in the new year of bringing one. I said it two years ago, if we all brought one, we would double in a year, just one. Father, we come to you this morning. I pray, Lord, that this ministry of reconciliation that I have challenged our people, Lord. I didn't do this to make them feel bad or condemn them, no. But to let them know that there is a biblical mandate for us to invite others to Christ. There's an urgency. Lord, and in the world, as messed up as it is right now, if anybody here still thinks, oh man, the gospel, how can I share the gospel? Are we listening to what the world is sharing? Are we listening to all these wild ideas that are being proposed by people? I'm understanding even it's only a little thing that there's, there are ways that you can look online to learn how to even kill yourself, commit suicide. And we have the good news, the gospel, Lord, so help us to be bold with our witness. And if we can't say it with our mouth so much, show it by our lives. And I pray also, Lord, for those that are watching online this morning, the same word is good for them today. They have been called also to reconcile people to Jesus Christ by sharing their witness with people in whatever way and method that God uses us to do. And I pray that you just bless us today, Father God covers with your precious blood bless us through this week and all we do until we meet again we ask this all in the precious name of jesus and everybody says amen god bless you church